I want to get lost in a film. I want to absolutely be taken over by it. I'm not involved in the craft of making film, actually, because in theatre I frame the shot. What I make frames it for the audience, helps guide the audience. <laughs> I'm Ez Devlin. I am a stage designer and also an artist at the moment. Actually, how did I put that? Because I've just done all this bloody art. I've been designing for theatre and opera and fashion and pop concerts for Beyonce and Kanye and Adele. And I also make solo installation work as well. I'm used to theatre. There's a context around theatre. I need that around my films as well. I want to be part of the conversation around the film, not just imbibing it. No, I'm thinking because we have a gap. Because we have a gap, and then it snakes around the corner. It's a film called Tango by Zbigniew Rubzinski. This is a film that I would advocate everybody having a look at. It'll take eight minutes of your life, and I think it's an extraordinary metaphor for everything. And a lot of my work perhaps wouldn't have happened if I hadn't seen it. <laughs> It's a sense of an entirety of human activity overlaid and happening within one contained frame. And it's actually infiltrated all my work since. Charlotte Gainsbourg and I were born the same year, 1971. And the first film I saw of hers was La Petite Voleuse. I immediately associated and found uh, her character incredibly resonant with mine. We were the same age. And then to rediscover her, Latterly, still the same age, funnily enough. The work in Nymphomaniac, I think, is exceptional as an exploration of uh, femininity, of female sexuality. Do you want to say goodbye to your mum? Uh. Goodbye. She's so addicted and determined to follow uh, one part of her character that she has to abandon another. She's trying to be a woman sexually and she's trying to be a mother. I think it's unusual to find a piece that goes that deeply into someone's sexuality with that level of vulnerability, exposure, honesty. Yeah, I think it's, you know, essential viewing, really. Uh, now, where is it going to go? Because those Eternal things... Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is a film that speaks to many of the things I'm fascinated about in terms of metaphor. And there's a book I read when I was about 16 called The Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci, which talks about systems of memory that are formed around architecture. So if you want to remember something, whatever it is, if you stick it to a number of things in a room, you will be able to recall it. And Spotless Mind takes that and then pulls it apart. Can't you see? I love you, Edward. OK, we're back in. The films that I'm genuinely attracted to are the ones that are able to abstract from the literal. So often, you know, we take on board that the film screen is there and that it's just a portal into another literal world. If the screen starts to move or be penetrated or open or revolve or turns out the screen is only one side of a sculpture or is the inside of something else, then you have to engage with it on, on, a, on a new set of terms. And Eternal Sunshine Spotless Mind just focuses that into the very specific and the very personal. Look, look where we are. When you have the possibility of anything through a camera's lens, how do you limit that? What are the, how can you impose on yourself the parameters? Whereas with theatre, there's already such an imposition of economy because you can only fit certain stuff in the room. So when films apply that kind of economy to their visual language, I often find that incredibly powerful. Give me a film without a screen. Give me a film in midair, and I'll, then I'll be happy. I first discovered the Jean Cocteau Orphée when I was working on an opera version of it um, by Philip Glass. The scene, particularly when a man is looking in the mirror, and you absolutely believe the man is looking in a mirror, and then he falls into the mirror, and the mirror splashes apart. For me, that kind of phenomenological illusion is where you open up a whole world of possibility in your mind. Actually, this book is a really fascinating thing because it, it's talking about euphoria of Victorian discovery of how to make a woman disappear down a hole or how to make a woman appear like she's floating. How do you vanish the cup of flowers underneath the hat? It goes through zoetropes, it goes through all sorts of things. I really want a film to have a hole so I can penetrate it, so I can walk through it. There's some extraordinary scenes in that film where he's 
drawing with white lines on a black background, and then he's punctuating a drawing with an arm and a head. And the films that I've been making for my installation work have apertures in them, so we know how to engage with a film. We're very used to it. But if you can also permeate it, then it becomes something else, and I learned that from Orfe, I think. I guess some of the most extraordinary and uh, important experiences that I've had in a cinema have been, if I analyse it, independent cinema. It's those experiences where you know you're having a distinct engagement with a voice that hasn't been diluted. It's the singularity of purpose and the way that a director's vision has been able to be seen right through in its completeness. We need to cherish and hold on to clear vision, clear train of thought that has been undiluted. Action. And that's a cut.